Hi, let's talk about nephrons. In this video, we'll discuss nephrons, uh, the structures of nephrons, the functions of a nephron, the classifications of nephrons, uh, the individual features of nephrons, and how they work to regulate water balance and the secretion and reabsorption of materials. We'll also discuss uh, diuretics and how they work. So here we have a rather cartoonish uh, view of a nephron. Um, so the, the major portions of a nephron are the renal corpuscle, which has two constituents. There's the glomerulus, which is a very specialized capillary bed surrounded by the glomerular capsule. So it's here that the process of glomerular filtration occurs. And so what happens here is that uh, blood plasma is converted into filtrate. You can think of filtrate as pre-urine. Now there are a couple of other processes that are going to be involving that filtrate as we move through the various tubules of the nephron, but let's, let's take a look at um, at, at how this works from a 10,000 foot view. So cortical radiate arteries give off afferent arterioles. These afferent arterioles conduct blood to the glomerulus. And then it's here that filtrate is produced. Coming out of the glomerulus are efferent arterioles, which feed into both paratubular capillaries and specialized paratubular capillaries called vasa recta, as we'll see. So these capillaries are going to completely ensconce the nephron tubules and we'll have the opportunity to exchange materials from the filtrate and the cardiovascular system of these paratubular capillaries. So there are two additional processes beyond glomerular filtration at play here. Uh, and they are in no particular order. Tubular secretion. Tubular secretion <clears throat> is a second chance for moving materials from the paratubular capillaries into the filtrate. So anything that didn't pass by uh, during glomerular filtration can, uh, can be passed into the filtrate via tubular secretion. There's also tubular reabsorption. And with tubular reabsorption, we have the opportunity of pulling materials out of the filtrate that we want to retain within the cardiovascular system and the body. So um, water is, is one uh, material that uh, makes it into the filtrate in quite a large quantity. And we reclaim that through processes of tubular reabsorption. Anything remaining in these tubules by the end of this process is going to be urine, which will be conducted through the uh, various portions of the conductive portion of the, uh, the, the kidney um, out into the uh, ureters, to the urinary bladder, and then out to the external environment via the urethra. <clears throat> so the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. And there are two distinct types of nephrons. There are cortical and juxtamedullary nephrons. Both of these are supplied by afferent arterioles coming off of cortical radiate arteries. So arcuate arteries in this case, or um, in other cases, uh, interlobar arteries are going to give off cortical radiate arteries. And we can see these afferent arterioles branching off of cortical radiate arteries and into glomeruli. So that renal corpuscle, so the capsule plus the glomerulus, is the proximal part of a nephron. Then there is a proximal convoluted tubule. This proximal convoluted tubule has convoluted parts and then straight parts. And then this feeds into the nephron loop, which dives down into the medulla. And then it comes back up into the cortex into the distal convoluted tubule. 
which then feeds into collecting ducts. And these collecting ducts merge, and then at the end of the collecting ducts, there's a renal papilla, and at that point, that filtrate is urine. So let's take a look at some of the differences between cortical and juxtamedullary nephrons. So cortical nephrons are more ubiquitous. Over 80% of the nephrons in a kidney are cortical nephrons. Uh, their corpuscles sit higher in the, uh, the cortex. Uh, therefore, they, they, they tend to be a little further along the cortical radiate arteries. They have lower glomerular filtration rate and shorter nephron loops. So we can compare the, the size of this nephron loop with the size of this nephron loop of the juxtamedullary nephron. You can see that the juxtamedullary nephrons loops are much longer. These juxtamedullary nephrons are uh, much less common. Um, they, they can be in greater proportion in more uh, arid adapted organisms. Uh, their corpuscles tend to sit lower in the cortex. They have higher glomerular filtration rates and longer nephron loops. And these nephron loops have specialized vasculature associated with them that we'll see called vasorecta that help to more fully extract water from the filtrate. And as a result, they produce a much more concentrated urine. So let's walk through each of the parts of the nephron and, and take a look at the different functions here. So much of what we're seeing here is the renal corpuscle. So we have an afferent arterial delivering blood into that specialized glomerulus. Um, so that's the capillary bed. Um, and then blood travels throughout the glomerulus and filtrate is produced. And this filtrate is then going to enter into the proximal convoluted tubule. Now blood also leaves via efferent um, arterioles heading out into those paratubular capillaries and vasa recta as we'll see. So the, uh, the glomerulus is very well specialized. So if we think about this as a serous membrane, there's a parietal portion to the membrane. That would be the lining of the capsule. And then there's a visceral portion to the serous membrane. And that would be the cells that are upon the glomerulus. And we call those cells podocytes. Those podocytes um, act with the capillary to provide a, a filtration barrier. You know, it keeps the formed elements of the blood in, it keeps some of the larger and medium-sized proteins in, and then everything else is free to leave as filtrate. So that process of forming filtrate has a rate that is adjustable that we call the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR for short. And that's basically just the rate at which uh, a glomerulus, or all of the glomeruli, can transform blood into filtrate. It is um, adjustable um, by various mechanisms within the kidney, as we'll see. It's also adjustable by various mechanisms that affect circulation both within the kidney and outside the kidney. So one interesting thing is that glomerular filtration rate is going to be directly proportional to blood pressure. So the higher the blood pressure, the higher the glomerular filtration rate. Also contained within uh, this uh, glomerulus are going to be specialized smooth muscle cells in between these podocytes called mesangial cells. The mesangial cells can contract or relax to, to make the, the distances between podocytes uh, either larger or smaller. And this is one of the ways in which intrinsically uh, glomerular filtration rate can be controlled. Now from the 
uh, glomerulus uh, and from the, I should say, renal corpuscle, filtrate is going to move into and through the proximal convoluted tubule. So there's two parts. The part that's immediately adjacent to the capsule is called the pars convoluta. That's the convoluted part. And then that's going to transform into the pars recta, or the straight part. So I have them distinguished here um, structurally. I, I, I don't want you to think that uh, these processes here are only occurring in the convoluted or the straight part because they can occur throughout the proximal convoluted tubule. In terms of function, it's important to understand that the proximal convoluted tubule is the principal and primary site for reabsorption. So most of the reabsorbed salts and the water that follows those salts is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. About two thirds in total of resorption of salts and water occur in the PCT. 100% of the reabsorption of glucose and amino acids, 80% of the reabsorption of citrate and phosphate are going to occur here as well. 65% um, of potassium reabsorption and about half the reabsorption of urea will occur in the proximal convoluted tubule. So PCT is all about reabsorption. But it's not exclusively about reabsorption. We also have some secretion. So various bioactive substances, uh, pharmacological substances, uh, etc., can be secreted um, into the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, ammonia, as a, a byproduct of cellular metabolism, can be excreted into the proximal convoluted tubule. And from there, that Pars recta is going to move into the nephron loop. So there's the proximal convoluted tubule heads into the nephron loop. Um, more often than not, you'll probably hear this uh, referred to as the loop of Henle. Uh, that eponym or honorific is uh, meant to honor uh, Friedrich Gustav Jakob Henle, who was a 19th century uh, German anatomist and pathologist. Um, so filtrate is going to move through this nephron loop, and there are thick and thin parts to the, uh, the nephron loop. In the, uh, in the thick part of the descending limb, we have the active transport of sodium chloride ions out of the tubes and into the medulla. And then in the thin parts of the limbs, we also have the passive movement of salts out of the filtrate and into the medulla. Well, owing to the movement of salts out of the tubule, that makes the surrounding medulla hypertonic, and water is going to follow the salts. Now, what's interesting is that there are these specialized vessels called the vasa recta. These can be thought of as elaborations of the paratubular capillaries, but they are specializations specifically for the nephron loop. And what happens is as water leaves, it gets picked up by the vasa recta rapidly and therefore into the cardiovascular system. That helps to maintain the hyperosmolarity of the medulla so that water can continue to flow out from the nephron loop and into the medulla and then be picked up by the vasa recta. And then that filtrate will then continue along into the distal convoluted tubule. So the distal convoluted tubule and the, uh, the collecting duct that follow is just another place for both reabsorption 
and secretion. Now, within the DCT, there are two types of name cells that are going to have very significant um, physiological functions. There are intercalated cells and principal cells. Intercalated cells are going to be for the retention and or secretion of bicarbonate ions and protons. So these intercalated cells are means by which we can help maintain pH homeostasis within the cardiovascular system. Principal cells have dual roles. So uh, principal cells can be um, acted upon uh, via different, um, different extrinsic hormones. So uh, for instance, uh, aldosterone of the RAA system uh, helps for the reabsorption of sodium ions and then water follows the sodium ions. So uh, principal cells help us to reabsorb water. So that is going to help to increase blood pressure. Um, water is also through aquaporins uh, reabsorbed from the distal convoluted tubule into the paratubular capillary beds with the help of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. Also, the distal convoluted tubule is an important uh, location for the reabsorption of calcium from the filtrate. And so that is, that is encouraged by the extrinsic hormone, parathyroid hormone, secreted by the aptly named parathyroid glands. Now that distal convoluted tubule is going to pass by the renal corpuscle. And so here we can see the distal convoluted tubule. And as it passes by the renal corpuscle, there is a specialized group of cells within that abutting wall called the macula densa. The macula densa, as well as the afferent arterial, together form a working apparatus called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is going to be one of the greatest um, effectors of renal blood flow and also glomerular filtration rate from within the kidney. So let's take a look at how this works. The sensory part of this apparatus is the macula densa. So the macula densa is very apt at detecting a number of things, uh, amongst them concentrations of sodium chloride, potassium ions within the filtrate. So when these concentrations are high, that's a way that the macula dense is able to sense that filtration is high, glomerular filtration rate. When these concentrations are low, that's a way that the macula densa can sense that glomerular filtration rate is low. And one major way in which we can affect glomerular filtration rate is by affecting the smooth muscle of the afferent arterial. If that afferent arterial is relaxed, blood flow increases and therefore glomerular filtration rate increases. If that smooth muscle contracts, then blood flow decreases and glomerular filtration rate decreases. In addition, there are specialized cells within the walls of that afferent arterial called juxtaglomerular cells. And it's these juxtaglomerular cells that secrete renin. Renin is the first part of that renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway or the RAA pathway, the end product of which is to increase blood pressure. So there's, there's a lot of control that is um, possible 
complements of the macula densa and that afferent arterial. It's really quite impressive. Now, diuretics are, um, are substances that um, enhance diureses. Diureses, as a process, is the increased production of urine. So uh, a person is producing more urine and, you know, hand in hand with that, also uh, urinating more, hopefully. Now, diuresis is uh, possible through perturbing one of two or maybe even both processes. Uh, the first is um, we can increase the tubular secretion of water. So we can we can move more water from the cardiovascular system into the filtrate. So that's, that's one way that we can make more urine. Or we can slow reabsorption of water. So instead of sending the, the typical amount of water, we send far less water back into the, uh, the paratubular capillaries. So the either or, or both of these processes are going to increase the amount of filtrate. And by increasing the filtrate, we increase urine and urine output. So diuretics are a very common and simple approach to treat hypertension. So if your blood pressure is too high, um, we can lower blood volume. And by lowering blood volume, you know, you can help to reduce the effects of hypertension. That's wonderful. So uh, a lot of, of drugs, a lot of uh, pharmacological substances that act as diuretics can help through various mechanisms, either increase secretion of water or slow reabsorption of water. Now, there are also other um, bioactive substances that um, people, you know, consume uh, recreationally, uh, such as caffeine that are diuretics. Uh, caffeine increases glomerular filtration rate. Um, it does so likely a number of ways, but probably the, the major way in which it does is by increasing blood pressure. Uh, caffeine increases heart rate, it increases blood pressure, and as a result, uh, higher glomerular filtration rate, more filtrate, more urine. Alcohol is another bioactive substance that, um, that acts as a diuretic, and it does so by inhibiting vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. By inhibiting um, antidiuretic hormone production that uh, lessens the effects of uh, tubular reabsorption of water in the distal convoluted tubule, so it, it slows that process. So we're, we're dealing with, with this part of the equation. And as a result, um, an individual is keeping more filtrate and producing more urine. So either of these two substances, you may, in, in your own lives, if if you partake, notice that they lead to an increased urine output. So if you're drinking a lot of caffeinated beverages, coffees, teas, soft drinks, etc., et um, you might notice that your urine output is greater. If you're out and about consuming uh, alcoholic beverages, you might also notice the, the same type of effect. And, and this is why you would, you would notice it. And so that leads us to the assessment question of this video. And that is, which part of the nephron is responsible for the greatest volume of tubular reabsorption? Collecting ducts? Well, tubular reabsorption does happen there, but that's not the most. Uh, distal convoluted tubule? Again, uh, it, it does there, but that, that's not it either. Glomerulus? That's more about glomerular filtration rate. Nephron loop of Henle? That's a really good place for the further elaboration for reabsorption of water, but that's not it at all. The principal site of tubular reabsorption in the nephron is the proximal convoluted tubule. Thank you very much for your time.